Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. We're continuing our series of interviews about the question, does the United States need a new industrial policy? And I say new because, as we have pointed out in these series of interviews, there is an industrial policy in the United States, and it's called militarism. Some people have called it the military-industrial-congressional complex. So does America need a different industrial policy than that? Now joining us again to continue our discussion is Bob Pollan. Bob is the co-founder and co-director of the Perry Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts. And thanks for joining us again, Bob. Thanks, Paul. Happy to be on. So as I said, if you haven't watched the other segments, you probably should, because we're going to just carry on the discussion from where we were. So, so Bob, if, if militarism, which has been an industrial policy in the United States for more, at least since the First World War, uh, if, if that's to change, what, what would it look like? The military model has a lot to uh, offer when we think about an industrial policy to revitalize manufacturing, to uh, move manufacturing into the green economy, to have an energy sector that is supported by industrial policy. That is, we have very strong public-private partnerships, so we do have a private sector, obviously, very active in the military-industrial complex. We have subsidies. Uh, we have large guaranteed markets with the, with the military being a big buyer. This is very important. If we think about, again, the failure of the Solyndra company, the solar energy company, as an example of how not to do industrial policy, the, the solar industry, the, the clean energy industry, could be supported by government purchases. Uh, we could also have policies uh, that provide a guaranteed market. They're called feed-in tariffs is the technical term. And these operate, for example, in Germany now. And they were started in the United States. They were started in California under Jerry Brown way back in the 1970s, in which utilities had to guarantee to renewable energy suppliers that they would purchase the electricity that is provided at a fixed price so that providers of solar energy, providers of wind power would have a guaranteed market. So they would, so private investors would invest, they could calculate their market, they could know what the price is going to be, which is exactly what the Pentagon has done uh, over and over again, including, as we've talked about, including in developing the internet. So we have a decent model there. Uh, the model has to be pushed out. Uh, another example, if we think about an intersection of public and private, uh, public transportation, uh, building out uh, a high quality bus service and rail service, you have a guaranteed market, you have private firms that would be producing the cars and buses, and that would help revitalize the auto sector and the uh, Midwest more generally. Just to be clear, when you say build the bottle out, you mean a policy at the scale or approaching the scale of the Pentagon, but not run by the Pentagon with, with clean energy as the objective rather than making war machines. Clean energy would be the objective if, you know, for green policy and in manufacturing in general. I mean, if, okay, if, we, you know, if we think about transportation, if we think about building public transportation at the scale that would enable us uh, to reduce all the problems caused by the car culture, including emissions, but not just emissions. We're talking about land use. We're talking about cities and so forth. All of those things uh, require an industrial policy that is uh, not assuming that the free market, and, and here we're not talking about the free market, we're talking about Wall Street, uh, because essentially industrial policy uh, gets set through Wall Street decisions uh, as to what they're going to finance, unless we have some kind of counterforce, and the counterforce would have to be public industrial policy. I mean, there, there was a moment for that during the Obama administration, and I always thought one of the most telling moments, which is they could have done this with General Motors. They given General Motors this uh, public interest mandate, production of vehicles, and, and, and many other things, from windmills to who knows what, but use that industrial base for clean energy production. And, and give it a public interest mandate. They virtually owned the place at the time, and they shied away from that, even though there'd been all you know, rhetoric that one would have thought would have led to that during the election campaign that elected President Obama in the first place. That's true. They could have done a lot more. It, they didn't do zero. Uh, the main thing that they did accomplish is that they did impose uh, 
uh, efficiency, uh, gas efficiency standards for cars that are going to be very important over the next decade in uh, dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that by 2025, the cars have to run on average at uh, 54 miles uh, per gallon. But in terms uh, which, of an industrial policy, that would have been a golden moment to take advantage uh, yeah. of the situation. And, and they simply, I, I think this leads to the next, next kind of question, which is if they didn't change the form of ownership in some way, of General Motors, if it just had a narrow serve the shareholders mandate, which is what they essentially gave back to General Motors, then they ended up where they are, which is let's just make cars again, but with less workers and more efficiently and, and, and better management, but essentially just making this, you know, with, with better fuel efficiency, yes, but certainly nothing to do with an industrial policy. Well, I guess it depends on what we define as industrial policy. I, I think that having the fuel efficiency standards are important. It's true that it is not uh, changing the nature of the corporate business model. That also has to change. In fact, we have a lot of evidence in the energy sector itself, both in the United States and throughout the world, where we, have, we do have a wide range of ownership forms. We have a very high proportion of utilities in the United States still. Uh, but elsewhere in the world that are publicly owned. Uh, we have um, uh, energy companies in Europe in particular. We have community-owned um, renewable energy companies. Indeed, in, in Europe, in Germany, Sweden, uh, Denmark, and the UK, 40% of all the wind energy that is generated in, in the world is coming from those countries of which almost all of it is community-owned wind farms. They're not these gigantic corporate-owned wind farms. They're located in communities, they're controlled by communities, and they've gotten a lot of benefits out of this kind of community ownership in wind farms. Not the least of which is that you have the community supporting it. And when the community supports the wind farm, then all the years that it takes to go through red tape to fight to put up a turbine, for example, uh, gets dramatically reduced because the it's the community's own property. And in fact, you argue in one of your recent papers that you really can't change the industrial policy without expanding these forms of community, public, various forms, alternative forms to straightforward corporate ownership. What's your point there? We've been, we've been dominated by the Wall Street model of corporate governance. Uh, and we know what the outcome there is. The outcome is that you have, among other things, uh, an investment uh, strategy that is basically driven by uh, bubble psychology. Uh, and we do get, we, we, you know, we get rapid expansion in the economy when we have a bubble going up, but then we get the crash, as we are experiencing now and we can't dig out of it. Um, Alternative ownership forms, uh, community ownership forms, public ownership forms will make for a much more stable investment process. That alone is important, stability in the investment process, because to develop new technologies and to have them integrated into the economy is a long-term process that requires long-term planning horizons, and you cannot expect to get high rates of profit every year uh, from these kinds of activities. So that's why you need planning. On top of that, again, uh, getting the community involved and having community support transforms the process in many ways. It integrates the community, it, the uh, commitment to job creation and decent job creation gets integrated into the model. And these models do work. You know, it's not pie in the sky. We well, have community owned wind farms uh, in the Midwest, in Minnesota and South Dakota. And they work. And the, why, why were they created in those places? To support the agricultural communities in those regions. All right. Well, uh, the, the, the yeah. right wing of, of, of both parties at this point would say this is the road to socialism. Well, OK, fair enough. Uh, you know, we can use that label. And uh, I myself don't have a problem with that. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about some democratic forms of socialism. But more importantly than the label, uh, socialism, social democracy, public ownership, mixed ownership. Um, the the mo most important thing is that we, we know that we have a failed model in a Wall Street-driven economy that produces financial bubbles. And uh, then we have, uh, we socialize the losses created by 
the uh, financial bubble. So we already have a form of socialism. We have socialism for Wall Street. Well, the, the, um, the, the other form of socialism that doesn't get talked about very much is the military. I think you, you were saying it's close to 5% of the, of, of the economy. It's all publicly owned, and uh, that doesn't get called socialism. And, by the way, it also provides pretty good health care for all the people in the military. Uh, so uh, we have a health care system, we have an industrial policy, we have an employment policy, uh, all operating within the Pentagon. So what I'm saying is, yeah, we can move that model into other areas, the most obvious being in the energy area, which we have to move there if we're going to have any hope of uh, not confronting the ecological crisis that... Uh, climate scientists is say is you know is around the corner, and we can't wait for 20 years to be totally in the ditch with this because we have to make changes uh, on an incremental basis. Uh, we should have started a long time ago, but we can still do something starting now. All right, thanks for joining us, Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.